Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to sit before you today. As I said before, um, this is a problem I've been thinking about literally for decades. Somebody said, are you old enough? Of course I am. Um, but the Constitution is an interesting thing, and I've always been a fan. Article 18 under the New Hampshire Constitution says penalties will be proportional to offenses and the true des and refers to the true design of punishment. It says all penalties ought to be proportional to the nature of the offense. No wise legislature will affect the same punishment to crimes of theft, forgery, and the like, which they do to murder or treason, where the same undistinguishable severity is exerted against all offenses, the people are led to forget the real distinction in crimes themselves and to commit the most flagrant with little compunction as they do to the slightest offense. For the same reason, a multitude of sanguinal, sanguinal laws is both impolitic and unjust. The true design of all punishment being to reform and not to exterminate mankind <coughs> I am sorry to say that when you look at the combination of laws in this state, regulations and statutes, we have 11,000 pages of rules and regulations and judges who will remind us that ignorance of the law is no excuse. We, as a society, have chosen to enter into a form of constant of a constitutional republic for which we delegated the ability and nature of government under that consent to be governed. Under Article 2, or Part 2, Article 5 of the New Hampshire Constitution, we delegated the ability to the legislature to make laws. And they said it was necessary uh, in defense and support of the government of the state and the protection and protection of the subjects thereof. <coughs> Part first, Article 2 of our New Hampshire Constitution. It is my second favorite article in the entire Constitution. It says, all men have certain natural, essential, and inherent rights, among them which are enjoying and defending life, liberty, acquiring property, punishing and protecting property, and in a word, seeking and obtaining happiness. Sounds pretty good. It's actually kind of simple, right? If you can only live so simply. However, Article 3 says when men enter into a society, they surrender up some of those rights. And they surrender to that society. Do you know why? They didn't expect us to guess. They told us right here. They said, in order to ensure the protection of others, that wasn't enough. They said, and without such equivalent, the surrender is void. A fascinating concept. I googled. I wanted to know when anyone had had the conversation about the surrender is void part. If I'm giving up my natural rights, why is it that, what am I getting in exchange? According to this, I'm supposed to surrender them for the protection of others. So, let me ask you, why is it that we are not looking at who the others are we're protecting when we are assessing our 11,000 pages of law? And if, when someone is being tried for a crime, we don't actually uh, pay attention to Article 15 of our Constitution. Now I know I'm referring to these by article, and so I'm going to make life a little simpler for you and say no subject shall be held to answer for any crime or offense until the same is fully and plainly and substan substantiated and formally described to him compelling or compelled to accuse or furnish evidence and no one shall be uh, compelled to uh, furnish evidence against himself. Every subject shall have the right to produce all proofs that are favorable to himself and to meet with witnesses against him face face and full, he ho fully heard. Yes, this bill does not say a constitutional lesson. It says victim with crime. I'm sorry? So you're repeating, you're 
reciting the Constitution to us. I want to know what you're going to do with the bill. I'm going to tell you that in just a moment. I'm trying to explain to you the construct and framework for which this I have presented this bill. And if you let me get two more sentences, I'll explain to you the rest. May I do that, Madam Chairman? How much more do you have? Two sentences. They're underlined right here. Thank you. It says, every subject shall have the right to produce all proofs that may be favorable to him to meet the witnesses against him face to face and to be fully heard in defense of himself and his <coughs> counsel. My bill, very simply, says, show us the victim. If you don't have one, then as an affirmative defense, there is no crime. The state itself is not a victim in these crimes under our constitutional consent to be governed. It's very, very simple. It was a long way to get down to one sentence. See, we have and have this idea of habeas corpus, produce the body. If someone's being detained, we bring them in and have the charges answered to them. And our people have the right to face their accuser. The accuser, however, should be a victim. We constructed our constitution to say we want to protect others. But if you have no victim there, who are we protecting? With that, I say 11,000 pages of law. If they have a victim, and that victim is, and it's listed plainly here, a person who suffers direct or threatened physical, emotional, psychological, or financial harm as a result of the commission of that crime or attempted crime is a victim. If you don't have that, then this is an affirmative defense. This doesn't take a single person off the road. This doesn't prevent a single arrest. It doesn't, pre it doesn't change any of the way the police do their job. It says there is one additional defense for a defense attorney to say, show me the victim, and then compel the legal system in prosecution to produce the person who was egregious. If there is no egregious party, if we cannot actually produce them, and they do not make an accusation face to face, then our um, accused have been denied their constitutional right to face their accuser. That's my argument, and I'm willing to take any questions. Can you describe a victimless crime? There are lots. One. Madam Chairman, I drove with an expired driver's license in the town of Litchfield in 1992. It was September 20th, I remember it well. My driver's license had expired on September 4th. They pulled me over, they wrote me a ticket, for which I paid the ticket. The next day, I drove to Concord, trying to comply with the law. I paid for my renewed driver's license. I then got a little yellow card and was told I had to show up for my appointment. I traveled regularly for work. I missed my appointment and had to go, and while I paid for my license and did everything but had my picture taken and taken an eye inspection test, I got stopped again. And I handed them my card and they said, we're sorry, that's expired. And they wrote me another ticket. The reason is because my little yellow ticket was only good for 30 days, but when I went to go get my license, they said, you can't have it, you missed your appointment. I had to reschedule. I did that. When they stopped me for the third time, they detained me and arrested me in Nashua on the day I was going to get my driver's license picture at my appointment at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I was arrested and detained. I had to have someone bail me out of jail. Now, if I've paid for my driver's license, I've complied with the law, and I'm trying to make my appointment, where was the victim? And why is it that they were going to charge me as being a habitual offender for, compel for committing the same crime three times, which was failure to get the piece of paper not to pay the tax? I paid my tax. I did my best to comply with the law and became a victim of this, and I became offended. I did research to try to find out why as a system of government I was detained and held behind bars for failure to not pay my tax or participate in the licensing process, but to have in my possession that piece of paper. When I presented my driver's license, which was expired, I was charged with a separate offense which is presenting an expired driver's license. Did you know that's a worse crime than driving without one? Where's the victim? We have 11,000 pages of rules for which we have citizens who could be charged. Let's give them a reasonable defense. You say 
you're talking about a driver's license being a victim, right? Your your episode is a driver's license. What about a person that's restaurant or home is robbed and they're not present? They don't have to be present to be a victim. Any <coughs> any removal of property. Uh, any theft of property, there's a victim, there's a clear victim, not a problem. This is not about being there and witnessing. This is about, if you have somebody say, I was impacted, no problem. Well, uh, then I guess I don't understand what your bill is trying to do. Could you explain it to me other than your driving and experience? <laughs> other than what you had, tell me other victim was crimes that you've seen that people have been I, I hear people talking about participation, uh, um, victimless crimes all the time. If you have someone who's driving down the road at, at 3 o'clock in the morning and is speeding, then they're, uh, and they're not putting anyone at risk. Why is a speeding issue um, a, something that we have a victim for? There, there is no one offended by the particular implementation of that law. And that's another example. There are hundreds and hundreds of examples. But you, when you're speeding, you're breaking the law. The speed limit says such and such a thing, and you're breaking the law. I, you know that is the law, so you're not a victimless. That crime is a victimless. I would believe that in case she, in case she asked me if I would. Um, I, I don't disagree with you on that particular point. Under Article 18 of the New Hampshire Constitution, which I read a moment ago, it says, um, for the same reasons a multitude of sangui sanguinary laws is both impolitic and unjust. Our Constitution says if we have too many laws, they are unjust. This one gives us the ability to implement any that exist. For example, do you realize that we have an, a statute on the books today that makes adultery a crime, except for we can't charge anyone with it. Uh, uh, the police won't, they wouldn't take a report against my ex-wife, um, though during our divorce I tried to have her charged, I thought it would be really good, but they said no, we can't take that. But we have these things on the books, but if they chose to, they could potentially charge someone. But where's the victim? Am I really? We need to make sure that laws that we have that are obsolete on the books are not enforced arbitrarily if we cannot produce a victim. Plain and simple. Thank you. Mm. Representative Ginsburg. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative, uh, would uh, private gambling among friends, would um, smoking marijuana, would prostitution be examples of victimless crimes? They would. Thank you. Can you cite, I'm sorry, may I follow up? Can you list for us some other victimless crimes that you think uh, should have uh, this as an affirmative defense? Um, any, any crime for which there is not uh, someone who is willing to make a complaint against that particular crime, in my understanding and reading of the uh, nature of the Constitution, um, would prohibit uh, this would create an affirmative defense. So can I list other ones? Um, there are lots of them. Um, let's we should give you some time to, to, to think about it. Representative Berube. You are aware, Representative, that uh, in the state of New Hampshire, it is a privilege to have a driver's license. Yes, sir, I am. Thank you for asking. And I paid for my privilege. Uh, I didn't understand that when I went and passed the test and actually paid them and they actually gave me that little card that said I possessed the privilege, that lack of that piece of plastic actually would revoke it. Representative, you oppose the Constitution. Does that come under that privilege of uh, being able to drive within the uh, aspect? I'm not sure I understand the question. But you would quote the Constitution, how you have these rights to this and that. But, you know, that, I'm a little confused because I always thought that it was a privilege, not a right, <coughs> to be able to drive with a license in the state of New Hampshire. Yeah. Am I wrong or right? No, you're right. It is a privilege. It is granted by the state. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Representative Lamb. Thank you for my question. Uh, would you agree that prostitution and sodomy would be victim of this crime? I would, actually. I did some research because I knew this question was coming up and I was very concerned about it. Um, and I would love to actually say that we have a solution to that problem now. There was a conference a couple of years ago where this was talked about in Las Vegas because they, you know, borderline with this all the time. Nye County, um, Nevada actually has a prostitution statute, but in Las Vegas proper they do not allow prostitution. There was a issue with the local police questioning whether or not um, escort services, which did not offer sex but allowed people to negotiate um, consensual adult behavior, could actually be construed as prostitution. You know, where exactly do you draw the line between behavior of cons consenting adults? If there's money changing hands for two people to spend time together, but there is no explicit contract for sex, is that prostitution was their question. Their answer when they analyzed it was that they were unable to figure out the distinction and that they have stopped charging people in Las Vegas proper for prostitution even though it is a questionable crime because they couldn't find a victim. However, when they actually passed this law, it enabled people who were potentially participants in <coughs> prostitution, which um, also could result in other crimes like abuse. Those people were then able to come in and say, I was abused and file a complaint so that those people could actually get the protection of law, which is originally intended by this system that says we are going to protect individuals against crime for which there's a victim. If we have a victim, there's an easy charge. If not, and you have no one to complain, why is there? Would you believe that many people would choose to disagree when it comes to sodomy that it has not affected society as a whole? I have no um, specific context for which to uh, agree or disagree. I do know that um, the people who came to this nation to found it had this idea that they did not wish to be overly regulated or have their behavior dictated. They wanted freedom. They wanted the ability to live by themselves. And we have a old saying here in New Hampshire that is hundreds of years old. Good fences get, make good neighbors, and within my property, what I do is my business. This is why when you walk through the forest, you will find <coughs> these little stone walls that you can't explain. Because everybody separated themselves, and they ruled and regulated themselves, came up with a constitution that allowed them the protection from the abuse of others, not from their consensual behavior. Follow up, Madam Chair. So what, the way you're pretty much saying is that anybody that uses drugs or creates <coughs> type of uh, creates uh, participates in the sodomy that that act would not affect society health-wise. Actually, uh, that would create a victim. Does it? Would it not? I, I don't know if it would, and if it would, then that would certainly be a concern. And if if the victim was willing to go out and make a complaint, then you know certainly they could be heard in court. The problem that we have right now is that, as I said in the adultery statute, you know where is the victim? We have a defined crime, but if we can't present a witness, then there's no face-to-face -face challenge. You bring a face-to-face -face challenge, the judge will hear. It. This is not changing the way that we arrest. This is not changing the way that the police behave. This adds an exception and reasonable defense to a defense attorney that says, show me the victim. That's all we're asking for. That's all I'm asking for in the law. I believe it's clear in the Constitution that the intent and construction allowed us to have face-to-face -face challenges of the people who were accusing us and why they were harmed. We are a society that is constructed based on contractual agreement. The people of this state, based on their previous, the pe previous residents, consented to be governed under these rules and regulations. That's a contract. If there's a violation of a contract, it should be heard in court. If there's not, why are we chasing these down? Thank you very much.